Hello, welcome to Info Fire, the fireside chat series from Information Matters. Info Fire brings visionaries and experts from diverse domains to share their stories and perspectives on a chosen topic. Each episode is a conversation between our guest and the host. I am Shalini Aras, your host for this series. I am an academic with more than four decades of experience in teaching and researching information. I founded two educational institutions. The first is the International School of Information Management (ISIM) at the University of Mysore, with a seed grant from the Ford Foundation. ISIM was the first high school in India established in the year 2005. In 2012, I founded the Myra School of Business with a focus on triple bottom line. In today's episode, I am in conversation with Professor Javed Mustafa, Dean, Faculty of Information, University of Toronto. to canada the topic of our conversation is trends in health informatics let me take a few minutes to introduce professor mustafa to our audience javed mustafa is an information scientist specializing in information retrieval problems and is currently professor and dean of the university of toronto's faculty of information Mustafa joined the University of Toronto in 2023 from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He joined the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 2007 where he was twice named as the Francis McCall Distinguished Term Professor and jointly appointed at the School of Information and Library Science I School and the Biomedical Research Imaging Center at the School of Medicine at UNC he led an interdisciplinary informatics training program called the Carolina Health Informatics Program CHIP a strong proponent of diversity and inclusion Mustafa led the creation of summer programs at CHIP to expand the participation of students from historically black colleges and universities online programs to support engagement of non traditional students and high school pipeline programs Mustafa's work focuses on multimedia information retrieval personalization and user modeling as well as cyber infrastructure for research and learning he has carried out projects focusing on developing novel applications of machine learning data visualization and equitable information services with more than hundreds of peer reviewed publications of his own mustafa has served in editorial roles for several prestigious journals in the field He was the editor in chief of the Journal of the Association of Information Science and Technology an associate editor for the journal ACM Transactions and Information Systems and currently serves as the associate editor for the journal ACM Transactions on Internet Technology He is also the co-founder of two US based companies Kiona Health and Semantics Mustafa was born in Bangladesh and spent his childhood years in Libya. Upon completing his O levels at a Catholic boarding school in Malta, he moved to the US to attend university. Mustafa began his teaching career at Uni- Indiana University Bloomington in the year 2000 where he also served as an associate dean of research and associate dean of academics. Let me now take you to our online fireside chat with Professor Mustafa. Good morning Javed. Welcome to Info Fire, the fireside chat series from Information Matters. I am really delighted and privileged to have this conversation with you on the topic of health informatics. Javed, if you were to look back in the rearview mirror, what yeah. according to you are the factors or the forces that led you to where you are now in terms of your research focus on health informatics? If you can you know, specifically share some pivotal moments or experiences that influenced your decision to focus on health informatics, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Shalini. First of all, uh, thank you to you and to uh, ACEST uh, for um, uh, providing this opportunity. Um, I think, you know, like uh, many people um, who sort of get into an area, their um, the reasons are multifaceted. Um, for me, there were, I think, two or three layers to it. One was I've been a... information scientist as you know for a long time i have always been very 
interested in um, information organization, a classification, um, uh, ontologies. Um, and uh, early on in my career, I would say going back probably even as early as mid 90s, um, I, uh, you know, I, I was uh, very fascinated to discover this whole area of uh, biomedical informatics, even though I was not directly involved in that area at that time, um, mainly through the work of uh, National Library of Medicine and uh, the work they have done around uh, uh, medical subject headings and, uh, and the PubMed uh, system. Um, and uh, I think at that time it was called something else. PubMed became uh, more of a common term recently. Um, and uh, I was uh, fascinated to see that uh, there was a whole organization, a very large organization dedicated to bring in, you know, structures and theories and principles of information organization and integrate that into electronic systems. And uh, so, the, you know, I think intellectually that was probably the roots of my interest. Uh, and I have started attending AMIA, uh, the American Medical Informatics Association meeting pretty early on in my career. And uh, later, I think uh, through personal reasons, uh, I started investigating the area of sort of uh, healthcare and use of information systems in healthcare. Um, uh, as I had to face, I think uh, many people do, um, the case of uh, attending to my parents and uh, uh, who were living with us at that time uh, in uh, the US. And uh, unfortunately, my father-in-law uh, had to be hospitalized several times. And I discovered that there were a lot of inefficiencies in the system. And... Uh, uh, again, this was early in my career, and uh, I started, I think, you know, then began to kind of take a stronger interest to see if there are ways I could contribute to improving a uh, health IT system. So I would say broadly, those were the influences uh, that got me going in this area. Okay, so from your own uh, professional interest in information organization, ontologies, etc., to okay. personal experiences of you know inefficiency right. in the health mm -hmm. information system led you to focus on health oh. informatics. That's nice. See, yeah. as uh, yeah, we have seen. In fact, I taught a course on medical information system way back in the seventies. So since uh -huh. then, you know, we have been talking about the electronic health records, or then it was called as EMR medical records. And we right. know that that is the bedrock of e-health, okay? Right. And they have been discussed over the last five, six decades, if not uh, more than that. And we also right. have seen, at least just to cite one example, in the U.S., right. the Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health, the High Tech uh, right. Act of 2001, uh, sorry, 2009 has been, you know, one of the, I would say forces that led to the speedy adoption of uh, EHR uh, in the US. So my question to you is what according to you are how much legislation, funding, etc. are important for the speedy adoption of uh, EHR and also what I mean, like, you know, the, we all talk, I mean, coming from different uh, backgrounds, mm -hmm. we all know mm -hmm. that digital divide is an important mm -hmm. factor in the adoption of technology yeah. and health, etc. So what are your views? Yeah. I think as far as speedy adoption uh, of any type of technology, I think is driven by, again, many different types of uh, forces and, and factors. Um, and, but when it comes to healthcare, uh, it was a fascinating experience for me really in the US to observe the adoption, broad adoption uh, of uh, EMRs and EHRs 
um, it's it's uh, it's it still remains to me. I think uh, many I think case studies could, probably should be done, and um, and lots of opportunities to study evolution of adoption of technologies in la in large scale. Um, I would not have expected. I mean, I'm old enough now to have seen days. Many years, you know, when there were a lot of promises, um, the history of this technology goes back to the 60s, um, uh, you know, when uh, large academic medical centers started adopting EHRs because they could uh, afford to do so. They saw the need for doing so to reduce errors, to reduce drudgery um, and, and gain efficiency, right? Um, uh, so it is not a new uh, technology uh, by any means in terms of digitization of medical records. In fact, not a lot of people probably know um, the earliest applications in AI, which is the hottest thing today, uh, were in, uh, in medical diagnostics. And uh, one of the earliest systems uh, of AI example um, application was MySim. Um, and then it became eMySim. <laughs> and so um, application of computing into healthcare, you know, goes back many, many, many years. But what was astonishing to me was that 2009 High Tech Act and its impact on a country of the scale as large as US. And, and I think the data will prove it. Um, the adoption took off significantly to a point now it's near 100% in large medical centers today in the US. It wasn't so before 2009. Um, um, it was probably, you know, even 40% or, or less than 50% adoption. Um, so I, I think you could ask, so that approach of having legislation, uh, is that the way to encourage adoption? I've spoken about this in uh, developing countries as well, in other countries that are interested in, in obviously adopting large-scale EMR, EHR. Um, and uh, I think different uh, countries would need different models and different approaches. And, uh, and uh, just a top-down centralized approach may not always be the best way um, to think about it. Um, but um, I, th I think I could give a whole day's lecture on meaningful use, the High Tech Act, and all of the things that are behind it. It's, it, it was developed, as I understand, uh, by an economist. The whole approach of uh, high tech acts uh, uh, adoption, which is sometimes referred to as uh, a carrot and stick uh, approach, <laughs> and it was yeah, fascinating. That seems to work yeah. always, right? Carrot and stick approach, <laughs> <laughs> right from childhood days. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought <laughs> that it would work at a country scale? <laughs> but. It's interesting. It was really, I think it remains to be a very fascinating uh, development uh, that requires, I think, further focus uh, from uh, our discipline also to understand how you promote adoption in that way. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, I mean, of course, as you said, it's not just the top-down approach, but then, you know, legislative frame framework gives that kind of a mandate for everyone to... Sure, sure, yes. sure. Uh, see, you started, as you know, we are professional, rather, the research with the information yeah. organization, ontology, etc. So some right. of these things are primarily about, you know, improving interoperability. So when it yeah. comes to EHR, the major issue is the interoperability, right? So unless right. we have a system in place which where you can exchange access data across organizations, across regions and globally also, the benefits mm -hmm. will not uh, really be the potential benefits will not yeah. be uh, able yeah. to achieve. So what specific strategies and technologies, according to you, have shown promise in addressing the interoperability issue in our challenges in uh, EHR? Yeah. Sure. Um, thank you, Shalini, for that very important question. 
again, I have um, been a researcher in this uh, health informatics, biomedical informatics, I would say conservatively, probably almost two decades now. And, uh, but I, <laughs> I, my wife doesn't like me to say it, I'm old. So <laughs> 20 years is not a large amount of time in my career. It's a, it's a, it's a portion of my career. Uh, the uh, time before that, I was in a di very different field. I was in more into um, and still actually do work in information retrieval and search and personalization and, uh, you know, areas of that kind. And so um, when I got into it, um, again, it was very attractive to me as a field how seriously scholars and practitioners in health informatics and bio, biomedical informatics uh, take the idea of standards and uh, standard development, standards development and adoption and use is particularly uh, prominent in health IT, especially in the US. And I think it's probably uh, applicable in many parts of the world. Uh, people who tend to work in biomedical informatics and health informatics, that is a respect a veneration for standards. The reason I bring standards into this, of course, without standards, you cannot have exchange and interoperability. <laughs> and uh, I think it has it helped that the, the, the whole area, the field always had this respect and, and had focused uh, on this as an important activity. So, you know, as a way of example, again, MESH, the medical subject headings, if you adopt a vocabulary ontology standard in your system and the other system adopts the same, then you can transact and you can share information and that same vocabulary will be understood, right? Just like in our uh, everyday language. Yeah. Um, and uh, similar to MESH, there are many other standards, for, as, we, as we know, you know, Snowman yeah. being another one. You know, there are many, many similar standards worldwide. Um, but they are well understood, well studied. Um, they are continuously evolving to keep up with uh, changes in the field, changes in the knowledge. So those things help a lot. I should add, I have also experienced that just adopting standards, of course, is not enough. You, you, uh, you are operating systems in the milieu of organizations and uh, in the milieu, in the context of uh, a city, a country. <laughs> and so uh, the... Uh, I would go as far as to say that the rules, regulations, and even the politics of that organization, of the city, of the country matter significantly. I have seen large scale, uh, uh, you know, information exchange uh, projects in healthcare with all kinds of promise and, 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 and investment fail. <laughs> because of economic reasons, because of political reasons. Um, so there are other layers that you have to take into account, obviously, to make systems uh, interoperate and exchange. And sometimes we don't pay sufficient degree of attention to those factors. Yeah. Um, in other words, just technology and standards are not enough. You have to think about the organizations and the larger milieu, right? Yeah. yeah. So there are many layers, even though standards uh, are the core or the bedrock of uh, uh, interoperability. Yeah. Right. 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 And we have seen even in the information organization or ontologies field, right? <laughs> Having <laughs> one uh, ontology is not good enough, right? Uh, anyway, we can <laughs> go on talking about the whole field of information, I mean, health <laughs> informatics and others. I would like yeah. to draw your attention to one particular aspect of, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, EHR, uh, the precision, I mean, everybody talks about how 
medicine is to be individual or personalized and precision medicine, etc. So that brings us to the question of how much of genomic data needs to be there in EHR and how do we integrate uh, you know, genomic data with clinical data, etc. So can you share some specific projects or initiatives that have successfully integrated genomic and clinical data? Yeah. Um, so I, I would say that um, I have mixed feelings about integration and further integration of additional uh, data um, and it's ironic because I am an, uh, really in, in heart a technologist. And um, the reason I, 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 I have uh, trepidation in terms of the promise versus reality is because I have seen the challenges of not just uh, the challenges associated with integration, the process of integration, challenges associated with well, what do you do after you have integrated? Um, and what is the actual reality of care delivery today? Um, in uh, the US, at, at least the environment that I'm familiar with, and probably also true for Canada where I'm now, um, the time to be allocated to diagnose and to arrive at uh, a treatment and to arrive at a plan is exceedingly short. <laughs> so, um, and when you integrate more and more and more information, uh, you have to, you know, really attend to the fact that is that being used and, uh, and, is, and how will it be play, put in practice? Of course, we know genomic information is very important to health. Um, we know of, actually, um, uh, there are famous studies. I think uh, there's this drug metformin, um, which after release, um, it was found out certain populations were not reacting well to the point of being dying. Uh, the way they discovered that is through a large degree based on uh, uh, digital records. Um, and they could, they could correlate that certain demographic uh, backgrounds probably were contributing, which led to finding out that there are genetic reasons um, of uh, malreaction, you know, to 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 that drug. Um, so uh, I I would say to to say where it could potentially benefit in the immediate term, not always necessarily in the diagnosis per se but to catch, you know, bad interactions, potentially, if they are well known, like in the order entry level, where, where the prescription is being generated, potentially. Um, uh, but it's still long ways, I think, to work out. <laughs> Imagine, you know, the labs you do today, you know, uh, the basic labs, uh, how many places are even able to collect genetic uh, data in a, you know, uh, uh, accurate way, in a way that is streamlined and will end up in your EHR in a proper way, and then that would be linked up. There are lots of uh, issues and challenges in yeah. terms of actual applications. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it has been shown in across different uh, areas like cancer research, etc. Yeah. Because you know the people, yeah. have, women have gone with this, uh, you know, actually getting going for a mastectomy just because there is a gene, mm -hmm. right? So all of those yeah. uh, challenges are there, and we don't know where it leads. That's so. all. So yeah. added to this uh, genomic and other personalization of uh, medicine or uh, precision yeah. medicine. There is yeah. this uh, paradox, okay, how much of personalization we need and then what it leads to or what it means to the privacy concern. So how do we sure. address the personalization and uh, privacy paradox? Yeah. So can you share some examples or, you know, case studies? Sure, sure, sure. Right sure. Of course, it's a very massively complex issue. And it's not just in context of medicine, in context of any type of information use, you can apply this paradox to education. Um, increasingly, we are excited about personalized uh, education. <laughs> I, I have done a lot of work in personalization. So I, I've thought about this paradox for a long time. 
And it's a very interesting uh, challenge because um, you can't have your cake and eat it too, in, in a way, right? Um, and in, the, in this case, there needs to be a somewhat uh, social, organizational, cultural uh, change as well. Um, at the end of the day, you know, pragmatically, there has to be a, a adaptation to the idea of that you have to trade off um, uh, clearly, uh, balance and trade off certain amount of your privacy to gain certain amount of benefit. Um, but this cultural change requires time and, and understanding and, and education. Um, and uh, people uh, are leaking, if I could put it this way, personal information all the time. Uh, uh, ironically, people don't uh, actually track that, especially if you think about your financial transaction from early morning to the end of the day, you, you give away a lot of private information, actually, right, through your uh, uh, per, uh, financial transaction. And we don't uh, think about it in that way. Um, but obviously that information is being used. Uh, you can guarantee it's being used by the cards that you use, the banks that own those cards. Uh, and, uh, but when it comes to health, when it comes to you know, um, education and other segments of our life, we become kind of rigid about uh, these issues, right? Yeah. But I think people have accepted the financial transaction because they're so essential, right? That you can uh, <laughs> think about carrying bunches of cash these days and <laughs> move from place to place. Yeah. Uh, so I, I would say that uh, to go back to the core of precision personalized medicine, there's a lot of promise there. Um, uh, but I also worry about, and this is the point where I would bring the digital divide idea. I, I truly worry about uh, creating unintentional barriers. Um, if we make medicine even more uh, esoteric and hard to access, um, and in terms of financially, because these are costly approaches um, to analyze you down to your uh, you know, a chromosome, your genome, and then design a treatment for you, it, they are very costly. Um, and But then that becomes more inaccessible to a lot of people. Um, so we have to think about these issues very carefully. I think uh, I don't, I'm not against the precision medicine idea, but yeah. we have to think about how do we then broaden it. And, and make it available in a wide scale way as well. And think about those cultural balancing issues as well. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe cautiously optimistic about the benefits of this rather than being gung ho about it. Right. <laughs> right. Or right. go all the way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My team says that. So I should go ahead with this. That probably is not the way. Right. Yeah. And one other topic or other issue that I would like to raise and ask you is about, you know, the wearable devices and the monitor, remote monitoring, especially right. these days, uh, there are so much, you know, many health companies are doing this uh, different way, including our own phone is a, I mean, yeah. mobile itself is now acting as a device which captures much of our data, right? So, right. Um, mm -hmm. According to you, you know, what are the significant strides that have been made in this area of wearable devices and remote monitoring? And then how it has impacted uh, health informatics or, uh, you know, in the sense of what I would say is, has it, mm -hmm. I mean, the relationship, you know, mm -hmm. whether health informatics has enabled more of this uh, or mm -hmm. the other way around also? What has been the relation, symbiotic relationship between uh, data and informatics and uh, telemedicine? I, I, I think uh, the uh, wearable and 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 uh, having ubiquitous sort of devices, as well as having, you know, I would add to that, Shalini, uh, ambient. Um, sort of intelligence or environments that can sense also. Um, and uh, so when you 
when you uh, walk into your car, uh, certain cars can sense um, and adjust your seat, adjust the temperature, same uh, as in certain uh, nowadays in certain um, offices and uh, uh, places where you work, they can adjust based on how many people there are in the room, um, things like that. So um, those kinds of sensing uh, technologies, sensor-based technologies, um, I think hold promise. The symbiosis, I think, comes from the fact that the platform for delivery of care um, uh, is also digital. Increasingly, as we just finished talking about how widely EHRs have been adopted, uh, the I would though say there are we are still in the very very early stages of promise <laughs> and potential. Data uh, from research uh, are coming to show over and over again the promise doesn't match with outcome on healthcare. Uh, over and over again. There's a lot of uh, optimism about adopting uh, technologies and uh, for, uh, uh, you know, mental health or for, um, you know, uh, maintaining your weight uh, or <laughs> helping you through your yeah. pregnancy. There are many, many promising uh, apps and tools and technologies being developed. But when you actually vigorously study them, through um, well uh, understood metric for health outcome, health benefit, the results aren't as promising yet. That doesn't mean that they will not be, uh, begin to show benefit, but we, we are still in the early days, uh, I would say. And the issues of, again, the privacy versus benefit, you know, um, balancing come up. Um, in this context, very much, right? And uh, I think there are needs for education and, and certain social and cultural uh, changes for people to begin to feel comfortable. Um, I agree, you know, even our phones are very powerful in terms of sensing, right? And even the earbuds and earphones are very powerful in sensing. They can even sense blood flow, um, uh, in your years. And based on that, they can detect certain changes in your physiology. Um, but what's the application? And then what's the impact? What's the outcome? Those remain to be seen, <laughs> I would say. Yeah, there's a lot of promise and talk, yeah. but we need to look yeah. at it from the metric of what has been the real <laughs> health outcome, right? Yeah. Right, right, right. Right. So we've been yeah. talking about EHR and especially with ontology standards, etc. That is right. the generally right. the domain of structured data, right? And mm -hmm. in EHR and in health informatics, uh, there is huge amount of unstructured data. And yep. especially the strides made in you know machine learning, etc., has yeah. given us uh, much yeah. more, I would say, potential or even power to mine sure. this unstructured data and use it for healthcare. Right. So can you, right. okay, do you have some case studies or examples uh, which uh, think, exemplify that? How I data think, analytics has, you know, significantly yeah. improved healthcare yeah. outcomes and operational efficiency as well? Sure, sure. I, I, I think in the, in the case of unstructured data, I see more promise um, because I see, you know, the need for uh, streamlining workflow streamlining mm -hmm. record keeping, um, very, uh, you know, nuts and bolts, practical uh, needs. So how do you take notes uh, that are unstructured and then uh, do analytics on it to summarize, to then uh, impose some standards and structures and link that data with other parts of the record and other records in the database how do you take images and even uh, you know animations and video um, and then analyze them and make them more useful in terms of again imposing data and structures on them so that they are computable um, at a very basic level? I see a lot of positive results in in research. 
Um, um, and image analysis is maturing fast. Um, I see promising results in radiology um, yeah. for, uh, you know, um, analyzing uh, cancer or cancerous tissues. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I see there are potential, strong potential for uh, applications um, here in this, in this particular broad area of, um, of dealing with managing and utilizing um, uh, computing sort of methods for unstructured, broadly defined, not just unstructured text, but image and video image as well. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. in fact, there was that famous uh, quote, or rather infamous quote about, you know, with all this, we may not need radiologists, etc. <laughs> 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 but anyway, the, it, uh, yeah. I mean, it segues into my next question that, you know, how yeah. this image analysis and, uh, you know, machine learning, etc. Yeah. have supported yeah. and further enhanced the telemedicine capabilities, especially, you know, sure. I mean, I come from, for example, India, where the yeah. reach can yeah. be enhanced through telemedicine, right? So you sure. don't have to sure. make all the mobile, one can take images and yeah. then So sure. uh, yeah. can you share some I, experience? In I, that? I think there's a lot of promise there as well, Shalini. I have done some work on online virtual care sort of space. Um, we had developed actually one of the um, uh, spin-offs, a company that I worked on with my students uh, early on called Kiona Health, uh, worked on triaging online um, and uh, not directly um, uh, video, but uh, uh, through voice and interaction uh, through phone. Um, so, so there are, I think technologies are, are, are uh, for uh, remote uh, uh, interaction with providers. Uh, um, offer, you know, it's again, it's one of those areas, telehealth goes back many, many years, you know, so it has very long history and many things have been tried in telehealth. Interestingly, uh, again, if you ignore the social, economical, political context, um, you can create, you know, many technologies till cows come home they're, they're not going to be adopted. Um, if you cannot pay doctors, if they do virtual care, it's not going to be adopted. Um, we see the benefit clearly, right? Um, uh, telehealth, in my view, will not necessarily replace one-to-one -one care per se, but it's a complement. It's a way to expand your abilities to, as you put it, Shalini, for reach and for certain types of very basic care, uh, the initial sort of interaction with the provider, just a quick diagnosis of, of basic problems can be done very well. But if you cannot pay the doctors in the <laughs> US, uh, you know, uh, telehealth visits only became payable, I think, uh, in a wider way during the COVID because of the situation we were facing. Um, so you will have to work at it. And this is why I love our field of information and information science, because we don't just focus on the uh, 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 nuts and bolts technology. We focus on the organizational aspect. We focus on the social aspects. And all of those layers need to be thought through. Uh, I'm thinking of the promise, the great promise in a place like India. Of course, there is a fantastic opportunity, uh, but you have to think about it from incentive perspective and, uh, and, and, and an economic and political perspective. Doctors, I guarantee you, are as powerful in India as they are in the U.S., <laughs> I, I, would, I would think, in terms of their, you know, political influence and their economic influence. So working with those groups and making it possible so that incentives are there for these parties to engage, I think will make okay. really uh, this telehealth promise come true. And the, the, the promise is actually tractable and there is potential, very positive potential for telehealth. 
right? So it's not just the technology, but also the other frameworks, you know, socio-economic and <laughs> political <laughs> frameworks right. that are necessary to make right. telemedicine uh, work successfully. Yeah, right? right, right. Well, we did talk about, and this, of course, when we talk about uh, data analytics, etc., we are essentially talking about AI. But still, you know, we yeah. need to specifically focus on AI because yeah. that is the talk of the <laughs> town today. So yeah. when it comes to AI and, you know, health informatics, uh, right. if you have some specific examples of AI application in uh, health. Yeah, manage, yeah. If you can yeah. share as, as, I, as I as I already pointed out, uh, Shalini, in the context of unstructured promise of, of uh, computing and AI, I yeah. think AI comes in 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 uh, from from point zero. Uh, in the sense that what I mean by point zero is when a prospective patient begins to seek out healthcare to the point of actually engaging with a healthcare provider, developing a treatment plan, executing the plan, following up on that plan to the point of getting better or managing that problem. At every level, AI can help. And, um, but we shouldn't be, again, I, I, I think there is a theme in my discussion today and I learned this. Believe me, it was not easy for me to learn as a technologist. And this is why I, I keep working on healthcare because uh, it's it much easier for me to develop large scale search systems and simulate them and run them and come up with recall precision F scores and publish papers in, in my other areas. In healthcare, it is very close to actual translation. You, you have to think about deployment, outcome, impact from, from initial planning of a research project, because that's how medicine works. Medicine is very much coupled with uh, translation. Um, there are very little theoretical <laughs> work yeah. per se. And so I, when I say that AI can help from point zero to all the way to care and care management, I truly mean it. Um, the drudgery of you know uh, generating data and capturing that data, the drudgery of finding the right provider pro for the for the prospective patient. Or in every instance, AI can help. But we need to think about the deployment. We have to think about the context of developing these tools and how this will be adopted the usability aspects of it, there are lots of layers to it, right? So I am very optimistic in many ways about pro pro uh, prospect of AI. And, and those I also inside healthcare uh, that are very pessimistic, I know people who are very pessimistic about AI in healthcare. I wanna say I understand their pessimism because they are half right. <laughs> They come at it from an organizational and use and deployment perspective and, and not overwhelming doctors even more because we're dealing with a situation, especially in the US, this whole phenomena of burnout, provider burnout is a major challenge. Providers are feeling they are under already too much pressure in terms of too much information, too much complexity. Um, that's where you know pessimism begins to rise, right? Uh, so we have to think through all of these layers to make sure that the promise actually comes true, right? Yeah, information overload is quite a. <laughs> and the other one, personally, I feel is that it's like a black box. You know how that has yeah. come. We don't know yeah. behind the yeah. model. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Explainability and. Uh, and uh, transparency, transparency is very important. Yeah, very important. Um, and yeah. you know, responsible AI yeah, in healthcare is much more serious or important than <laughs> <laughs> any other field, right? Responsible, that, responsible in multiple layers. Like right? responsible, is it the right care to the point of fairness? Um, are we assessing it in the right way? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, all this promise is nice, and you know we are all very, uh, as I said, you no know, very positive. I mean, like optimistic, and hope that you know it's like a panacea. But then right. still uh, long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that brings me to the final question, which is about the field. You have been an educator and not just a researcher in the area sure. of health informatics, and then you know sure. you have developed programs and uh, across uh, yeah. different universities. So this is a multidisciplinary field, right? See, yes. everybody talks about multidisciplinarity and all of that stuff. But the challenge is, how do you bring all these different people, whether computer science, healthcare, and others as well, including right. social scientists, epidemiologists, whatever, all yeah, of them, yeah. and then yeah. you know, sort of uh, integrate the different perspective? You know, it's I, a I, challenge, right? It is a big challenge, uh, Shalini. And I think this is where we have to raise and re recognize. Uh, raise our respect and re-recognize the importance of institutions like universities and institutions like, I would go even say, uh, our political leaders. Um, This is where the role of those central institutions and leadership play a significant role. And let me bring it down to earth. The way I created the Carolina Health Informatics Program, CHIP, uh, with a lot of help uh, Mm -hmm. from my colleagues, Mm -hmm. but it would not have worked Mm -hmm. if the central provost office did not give the thumbs up. And not only that, I learned this through experience in my previous uh, tenure at IU Bloomington. They not only, if you are creating multidisciplinary um, multi, you know, division or cross division centers or institutes or programs, you not only need the blessing, you need their, in the initial few years, you need their direct support uh, and be able to guide step by step all of the, uh, you know, key milestones for, for, for your work. And this is this is the reason I uh, say that central leadership and even the political leaders ha- have to play a role, spe- especially for uh, healthcare, because they tend to have you know regulatory uh, dimensions and uh, they require funding. <laughs> so um, I, I I I I think my key message would be work with central leadership. Mm-hmm. from day zero and get their support, long-term support, not just, you know, uh, we will give you some money and please don't bother us anymore. Um, so this that's the way I think to build these multidisciplinary initiatives. Yeah. Okay. That is nice to know that, you know, at, at least at universities and such institutions, yeah. central yeah. leadership takes you know, the, uh, initiate you as well as provides the framework for multidisciplinary yeah. programs. That would be, right. I mean, that would at yeah. least result in, uh, yeah. say, successful uh, programs. And as you said, I mean, I like the word that you use, respect for other yeah. people. Yeah. I mean, you know, I say that the disciplines, you know, sometimes people don't have respect for other disciplines. Yeah. <laughs> they have to have respect for other disciplines and their methods and their, you know, theories. Right, and, right. A hundred percent. And, I, I think it has changed in my lifetime, even from hardcore technologists. Yeah. I, at least in the University of Toronto, um, the leadership at uh, you know arts and sciences, people who are responsible for computer science and and engineering deans and uh, deans for public health and medicine and um, you know other social science and other disciplines, they they the leadership do understand. Everything I've been talking about since the beginning mm-hmm. in healthcare and technology, you cannot be so narrowly focused that you just are building the box, if you will, you know, or building the algorithm and the software. That's not going to go very far, especially if you want impact. Yeah. Um, you can publish some papers, probably, um, but. <laughs> Or even a book or two, <laughs> yeah. but uh, in healthcare outcomes matter. Okay. That that's why I love this as a as a laboratory even of doing a certain type of scholarship 
that really connects universities to communities, really connects academic to human day-to-day -day affairs, right? Um, healthcare is a marvelous laboratory for that. We have so much to learn uh, from yeah. other disciplines uh, from it, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Javed, for this uh, opportunity.